Hello everyone and welcome to LA Currents. I'm Anita Bennett. Well, after over 40 years with the LAPD and the last five years as chief, Michael Moore is retiring. So what's next for the chief and why now? He's here to tell us. Chief Michael Moore, thank you so much for joining us. Hello, thank you for having me here. Yeah, so <laughs> why now after you accepted a second term? Well, the, uh, the timing is right for me, for my family, but also I think for the city. Uh, with Mayor Bass's election, I, I felt in my term coming to a close at, at, in, me, in the month, immediate months afterwards, uh, we sat down and met and talked, discussed the needs of the city, what her ambition and her goals were, and what mine and where I saw the city and the department and what our needs were, and they absolutely aligned. And so uh, I uh, sought a second term, and she was gracious enough working with the, uh, with the Board of Police Commissioners. To, the commissioners approved that, and uh, she uh, agreed with that. But even then I said that uh, this would not be a full five years. Mm -hmm. And when I provided an exit strategy, I didn't want to say it's going to be a year. I want to say two or three years because I wanted the organization to remain stable. I wanted the organization to continue in its initiatives to keep pressing forward. But also, as the, but at the end of the first year of Mayor Bass's office uh, as mayor, you know, I looked at the success that she's achieved, her agenda to invest in LAPD officers, to invest in our equipment, our technology, to seek a record contract for our rank and file, to keep uh, not just attract but to retain our people. That first year's initiatives, she was hitting it out of the park. So as we come to the end of her first year, you know, I also recognize that the counterbalance was a family that has devoted their time and energy to support me all these years as chief and in four plus decades. And I thought that now is a good time. It's never the right time, or it's never the good time, but it's always the right time has been said. And I thought now is the right time. So before I began my holiday vacation to go back and visit my, my daughter uh, who lives in Tennessee, uh, who we typically see two or three times a year, I said, Mayor, I think it's time. Uh, when we get back, I'd like to sit down with you and talk about you know, how that transition, how to keep it smooth, how to keep this organization moving forward, mm -hmm. how to support her inside safe initiatives, her emphasis on public safety, and on running uh, and overseeing and leading in the second largest city in America. When does your first term officially end? My first term ended actually last June. Last June, okay. So you accepted a second term, yes. and then you visited your family in Tennessee. What was it about Tennessee that made you make this decision? Uh, my daughter. <laughs> it's entirely. But you said, you said <laughs> after visiting Tennessee, I really decided. Well, it's, it's I'm a, a person that has had uh, enjoyed uh, 32 years of marriage with Cindy. Uh, she's been uh, very much part of my life. Uh, she's been part of this department. Uh, we frequently attend events. Uh, her identity is well known throughout the organization and, and through many parts of the city. And that commitment to me is one that she's been generous with. My daughter, who has been back in Tennessee to go to school mm -hmm. and has now set roots there, um, she's, she's our center. And Sunday night dinners and spending time together, uh, we're blessed to have a family that is that, is that tight-knit. And as at this stage of my life, I've done my work here. I think I've, I've uh, put everything on the table. I think we've achieved success. Uh, I'm proud of the work, and I think the, the work is going to continue because we have an outstanding organization of leaders. We have an outstanding organization of people that go about their work. And at this juncture, at this time, uh, now is time for the commission to look and seek and find an interim chief that will serve for a short period of time while they go about the larger task which is really finding who will, fall, who will lead this organization into the events that are in front of us, such as the 20, uh, LA 28, mm -hmm. the police uh, or the uh, we're, Olympics. We're going to get to that, the mm -hmm. Olympics, um, the World Cup. Um, but I want to go back to, you mentioned recruitment. And at one point, it was like the levels, the ranks were at a critical level. So what's, what's being done and how much progress have we made? Yeah. So what's being done is we've improved our marketing. Uh, there's, the city has supported us with added funding for marketing efforts to attract uh, the most qualified applicants. Mm -hmm. We're in a very jo a competitive job market, not just in, in here in LA, but across America for policing. And so the, the monies that have been invested in the city, by the city in us, as well as by the police foundation, is now, is now allowing us to advertise and be seen uh, in many more eyeballs and many more people who uh, may be attracted to this profession and define it in a way that we demonstrate that this is an opportunity of a lifetime. Secondly, the efforts of the mayor in 
giving us a record contract for the rank and file, a four-year contract uh, with wage increases that in my, life, my time with LAPD I've never seen. She recognized the importance that we be competitive both financially, both in benefits, but also in our working conditions. And that record uh, investment, I believe, is going to return not just in an effort of retracting more, but also retaining. When we saw the outflows of the organization in the last three years, the biggest uh, disappointment was that about 200 officers each year we were losing, not because they were f facing retirement, but because they were attracted to other agencies. They're attracted to find what they thought were greener pastures. The mayor's contract and in, in supporting the rank and file, I believe, is making a change. We've seen that change already mm -hmm. in the last, uh, since the implementation of this contract. We've seen the outflows of individuals that were not forced out because of retirement requirements uh, be reduced by a third. And that is an important step forward as we rebuild this organization, is that we not just build our academy classes, but that we retain those employees for, for their full term. Stop the bleeding. Stop the bleeding. Mm -hmm. So you said three years ago you saw this major shift. Was that the pandemic? Was it uh, calls for police reforms? What, what prompted that shift? I think we had the perfect storm in 2020. Uh, first of all, when I took this position uh, some five and a half years ago, no one knew what a pandemic was. Yeah. Uh, we have seen record uh, lows in regards to generational lows in regards to crime in the city. We still had far too much violence, but we had lows as far as uh, less than 300 homicides for more than a decade. Uh, there was, uh, shooting violence had been reduced. Uh, property crime was on, the, was on the downturn. And all that changed in 2020. We saw it start with the pandemic, and as it spread across the world, we saw the devastating impact it had on every aspect of society. And in the midst of that, in the early months of it, as America was frozen, and streets were empty as if it was an apocalypse. We then saw the horrific images of George Floyd and the murder thousands of miles away. But in the quarantine and in the isolation and in the turmoil and frustration, admittedly, for the injustices in America and the injustices created by policing at times and, and, and currently in parts of, of the world, we saw civil unrest, we saw anger, frustrations, and we saw riots here in the city of Los Angeles. Those work conditions where we lost officers who we could not protect from the pandemic. We, we were first responders. We were essential workers. We had men and women that we could not get uh, face masks, that we could not get a vaccine to. And we were losing people to that terrible, vac to that terrible pandemic as a tremendous demoralizer. Couple that with then the anti-police sentiment, the defund movement, the, the criticism where months before we were essential and we were, we were heroes. Now we were seen as villains and enemies of the very communities in which our men and women were sacrificing everything in order to come to work and protect. So, so a very demoralizing period of time for not just the Los Angeles Police Department, but for all of policing. Around the nation. Around the nation. And that, what we saw immediately after that, and I've seen, uh, I saw the worst of it, was we saw not just the rank and file, but mid-level and senior officers and chiefs. The turnover at the major chief level has been profound. Uh, when I started in, in the cities across America, we have a major cities chief association, some 65 cities of 500,000 people or more. Uh, when I look around that table today versus when I, when I first entered that table in 2018, there's one or two people there were there besides myself that are there today. Wow. And, and some of those seats have changed two or three times. So it wasn't just the uh, uncertainty of the pandemic and the tremendous turmoil that that created, but it was also at a time when the criticism and the underappreciation of police created a sense of hopelessness. Mm -hmm. Now we worked through that. I'm proud of the work of this department in addressing those realities of doing everything possible to protect our people, to build their resilience, to build their understanding that why they're hearing these remarks and the, and the hate and the violence that came with it. We had officers that suffered fractured skulls, broken legs. During the protests. During the protests and <laughs> demonstrations that other people were saying were peaceful. And while the vast majority were peaceful, there was also acts of arsons and devastation, but not, not just here in the city, but across America, that left a, a real scar uh, on, on the psyche, if you will, of this profession. What I'm proud about is that we worked through that. We stayed committed to reforms. We stay committed to recognizing that we own a part of the criticism of policing, and, but also the proud uh, 
ambition of recognizing that our cops count, that police matter. And what I'm really pleased also was that, as I soon depart, is that we are seeing that pendulum swing back and recognizing the importance of officers, the sacrifice of officers, the good work that they do, and that the vast majority of time, the vast majority of them, are dedicated professionals. And we have people who tarnish a badge, who fall short, mm -hmm. and no one hates so, a bad cop more than a good cop. So what changed to swing the pendulum and to allay fears, particularly in the black community, yeah. after George Floyd's death? So I think that the reforms that, the, that policing took, not just in Los Angeles, but across America, when we looked at how we use force, mm -hmm. when we look at how we police in communities and recognizing that our efforts at times we believe we're helping when in reality we're undermining or we're, we're lessening trust in those communities. Our ability to adapt and, re, and, and, and change our perspective and recognize also that public safety is a shared responsibility. Policing are problem solvers. They want to come in and fix everything. And at times that actually has made problems worse. So in Los Angeles, I'm proud of the work that we've done to remain committed to our North Star, the values of building and bolstering trust recognizing that we need to listen to our communities, be responsive to our communities, acknowledge when we mess up, uh, fess up to it, but also champion and ask the public to champion when they see good policing, because they see it every single yeah. day. But it can't be seen, it's like your health, you just can't take it for granted. You gotta recognize it, you gotta acknowledge it, and that's what builds hope, and that's what builds confidence, and that's what builds resilience. So you started out as a police officer. What did you learn walk in the beat that you took into leading? When I first started back in the 80s, as a very young individual, you know, I've grown through, you know, I, I will say three or four stages of life. Uh, some things have remained constant and some things have changed. What I learned back uh, as I first came on the job is that we make, we stand uh, to help and serve, to protect. And we do a lot more serving than we do protecting. That people need us and we need to be, we need to see them as individuals. Uh, we need to build relationships with them. Uh, we need to uh, do everything we can to help them. And at the same time, we need to recognize that that can only be so, that can only go so far. Yeah. You talked about the police commission choosing ultimately your successor, not just the interim. Mm -hmm. um, are they going to look outside the department or within? So I'm, uh, the, I'm proud of Mayor Bass again here as well as the Board of Police Commissioners. They both expressed the body which is charged by the charter to identify and evaluate and send to the mayor uh, three most qualified individuals. That's the Board of Police Commissioners. That's their task. Uh, and, but the mayor has announced and the commission has, has also uh, discussed that that search needs to be across the entire nation. Uh, and it's fair. This is the second largest city in America. Uh, it deserves the very best of the best. And in doing that, I think a nationwide search uh, if the next chief, which I hope is from the organization, uh, but if that is done by not looking externally, then there's always that question, well, is this person the most qualified? Was there someone else out there that actually could have brought, brought more talents, more skills, more capabilities? So some people uh, within the organization have expressed uh, some criticism of that or some, some regret that oh, you know, this, they, they would desire the, the commission to solely look inside. And my remark back to, to them is have confidence. Uh, I believe that there are no finer set of police leaders in American policing than in the Los Angeles Police Department. That is affirmed both in my, my daily uh, working with those men and women, my work across policing in America, as well as the experience of chiefs and officers who have left here and gone to other agencies to only say back, I wish I had known how much we have going for ourselves here in Los Angeles. So they will do that nationwide search. Uh, they're currently seeking input. I, every listener here who's a Los Angeles resident, a stakeholder, uh, look for surveys, look for outreach efforts. There'll be meetings by the mayor as well as by the Board of Police Commissioners to, uh, to seek input. Uh, as well as to complete surveys and essentially ask Angelinos, what do you want to see in the next police chief mm -hmm. uh, in Los Angeles? Once they compile that information, sort it, organize it, they'll formulate a job bulletin or an announcement that will describe that ideal candidate. That will be published and then we'll seek uh, input in you know, applicants from uh, across America. And then the process will be able to screen those to a qualified set 
of, uh, of individuals that then the Board of Police Commissioners will be charged with evaluating before that those final three candidates are sent to the mayor for her uh, de you know, deliberation, consideration, and then eventually her appointment, which will then be subject to confirmation by the city council. Um, let's talk about some of the upcoming events. How is the city and the LAPD preparing for the Olympics, the World Cup, and the, you know, the Super Bowl that's coming back? So what's really good about LA is that we are this world-class city that has so many major events on an ongoing basis. We're an entertainment capital of the world. We have some of the highest concentration of major sporting venues and events we are convention centers, we are business trades, we are all of all the makings, a very cosmopolitan city, a region that is some 10 million strong. So it's not like this is our first rodeo. Uh, so there's some, to some benefit, we have the benefit of just recently having had a Super Bowl. So welcoming it coming back in 2027. Uh, we had the NFL week here in downtown Los Angeles. We had the hospitalities and so forth, and it, w it worked wonderfully. So, but we're not resting our heels going, well, we've seen here, you know, been here, done that. LA 28, the, the Summer Games and the Paralympics, will be a, without match in Los Angeles history, even larger than the 1984 Olympics, mm -hmm. when which I was a young officer at the time. Uh, it will be a Super Bowl every single day at venues across the region for two weeks. And so that is a huge engagement. We have already started our planning and our assessment. Uh, we have put a planning team together. We traveled to France some two years ago to see what Paris and France is doing in their preparation. We took notes. We, took, we met with a number of officials and we said, here's where they're at at how many days out from their 2024 Olympics. We'll be sending another delegation here in the next month and a half to do a check-in and then during their Olympics, we'll also monitor and in the aftermath, see what their lessons are, what lessons have learned. We've gathered a planning council, we've gathered a region of public safety uh, representatives, and we've begun scaling and modeling what our response and planning and execution will be. So incorporating other police jurisdictions as well. Absolutely. The LA-28 Olympics will not occur just within the city of Los Angeles. There are venues in Orange County, Long Beach, Santa Monica. Uh, those additional venues in Inglewood, those venues will require coordination of the fabric of public safety mm -hmm. in this region. And now we're, we're ahead on that in the sense that we already work that fabric of public safety every single day. And so, but we're gonna strengthen it, we're gonna deepen it, we're gonna see where our, where our gaps in technology, where our gaps in tools and in facilities and in staffing are in preparation for that event. The World, 20, the World Cup in 2026, will be uh, an effort to build through that and learn from it, so in, in better preparation, mm -hmm. further preparation for 28. So preparation and working together. Um, you said you were a young officer during the 1984 Olympics. Did you play any role as an officer? So I was an Olympian, I'll tell you that. But no, I, <laughs> uh, but no, I, worked, at, uh, I, know I, I worked at quite extensively. I was, uh, the, uh, I was a police officer working in Newton Division, and the entire city, entire uh, department mobilized and I had the benefit of working uh, the, uh, the West Side Pavilion, the UCLA Pavilion, mm -hmm. and the, which was, uh, both had housing as well as had a number of events there. I was assigned to an ATV uh, detail. We patrolled uh, the Westwood Village and the region around there. Uh, we were very concerned uh, in the aftermath of the 72 Munich attacks about terrorism in the city, uh, about the potential for us being a target. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, what we found was that preparation was, uh, it was I, I'll say today, in retrospect, uh, will be tenfold more. But at the same time, it, I found it to be one of the most celebratory times in our history. It was a, a, a tremendous success. And as an officer, uh, I'll miss 2028 uh, as a member of the organization. But at the same time, I have every confidence that as, we were, as this was announced, that uh, with that experience that I had, that we have done well in preparation as part of the LA-28 planning committee uh, to ensure that uh, we build incrementally up to uh, the crescendo of the event itself the event. and in the aftermath. How important will technology be in protecting these events? Oh, tremendous. Uh, the technology will play a, a critical role. It will, not, it, will not be the, uh, it will not be the lead, but just as technology has impacted every aspect of our lives, mm -hmm. uh, that we see the same as to how to optimize technology to uh, be a force multiplier, 
to be the detector, to be the one that goes through and goes through all the data, goes through all the information, and, and synthesizes it and identifies what should be we should be tending to, get rid of the white noise. So it is uh, everything from credentialing to surveillance to safety systems uh, to supporting transportation needs, uh, all as housing, all aspects of, of this. Uh, I think uh, this is an, a tremendous opportunity. It's one of the aspects we're looking at in Paris. You know, how are they using technology? Uh, we are very interested to see their command and control, how they do incident management, uh, multiple, uh, monitoring multiple venues over a course of a 24-hour cycle on a two-weekend deal, recognizing it doesn't just stay those two weeks, it builds up. Yeah. You have the event itself a week down, then you have the Paralympics, then you have, you know, the, the, the uh, as things are then uh, de-escalated and, and things are put back in their place. It's unfortunate that you won't be here for all of this. Well, it's, it is, but at the same time, you know, it's every time there's a season. As I said in my remarks when I announced my retirement, you know, there's, a, there's an old adage about an hourglass, and, you know, I recognize uh, with 42-plus years that there's more sand in the bottom than the top. Uh, again, I've had a wife and a, and a daughter who've invested much to allow me to do this work, and at some point, it's, it's time. And I, I, in judging this in the balance of my life, uh, I'm, uh, I'm proud, I'm humbled, I'm privileged to have done what I've done. But I also believe that it's it, knowing when uh, to hand that baton. Uh, this is work that will, that will never end. And I'll, people have said, you know, once you're a police officer, you always are. And I believe that to my soul. Uh, the, uh, public safety, the, the, the pursuit of making a difference in people's lives, of helping and protecting, um, you know, helpers are helpers. And I, I know I'll always have that. But at a certain time, at you know, certain stages of life, you got to recognize it's time to turn the page. Um, you talked about your family quite a bit. What are you most looking forward to doing with your family when you retire? Uh, the, I look forward to Sunday night dinners. Uh, we had, prior to coming on, uh, uh, prior to my daughter going away for school, Sunday nights were particularly, uh, uh, you know, enjoyable. Uh, and so just that alone is something that I've missed. Uh, my daughter and, and Cindy and I, we speak every day. Uh, now, the wife and I, we live in the same state, but, you know, I speak in the, in the morning and in the afternoon. I won't say we're a helicopter parents, but, you know, I'm blessed to have her tight in our life and interested in what we're doing, us and her. And I look to have that proximity closed uh, more than the 2,000 miles that it is today. And in the next 10 years, I want to see that time and enjoy that time and not have regrets with spending that time and that valuable time with them. Uh, verse uh, here in Los Angeles. I don't leave Los Angeles in a lurch. Los Angeles is in a great, it's a beautiful city. It's a city on a hill that is that bright beacon of hope. Uh, and this department, I believe, is well suited to continue to rebuild with Mayor Bass's support, the council's support, and the public support. I just want to comment on that a minute. We saw this last year, an increasing building of trust and a rebuilding of trust, particularly from the 2020 civil unrest and the, and the injury that the public, the police had with the public's trust. Last year, the LMU study that was released in August showed that beyond, other than your no, local neighbor, the people you trust the most is your local police officer. Hmm. That wasn't the way it was three years ago. I'm proud of that moment. I'm proud because we could have, with everything that's happened to the city and everything that's happened to this department, we could have just retreated back, gone back to our old adage of enforcement, arresting our way out. But instead, we focused on leaning in. What can we do better to bolster and build that trust? What can we do to ensure that reforms are in place, that people see us as protectors, as servants? And it's paying that dividend. The, the path forward is bright. Uh, we need to continue to keep our foot on the pedal mm -hmm. to rebuild this organization for the demands. Our service levels today, while we're meeting the demands for emergency calls, our routine calls, are taking far too long for what Angelinos have historically... Response time. Yes. Have what, what response times they have historically expected for a routine call of a problem in the neighborhood. We're on borrowed time with that. We've got to reduce that time because when you call 911 and it's a routine call, recognizing that the vast majority of calls we're giving to alternatives, but you've got a neighbor dispute, you've got a person that's creating a disturbance uh, in, your, in your neighborhood or at a business or something, uh, an hour to wait for a police officer is is, is too long. Mm -hmm. And so that is directly attributed uh, to the number of people we have. Also, having officers that simply respond to call to call to call and don't have time to interact and have 
uh, uh, non-enforcement kind of interactions. Hello, the ability, you know, what, what's the most important thing to you? What's going on in your neighborhood? How can I help? That available time needs to increase. Today, officers are too often going from call to call to call and are seen as just order takers rather than individuals that are there to help build relationships, determine how can we better serve. So added personnel at this time uh, needs to continue. I'm, I do believe that we've seen the worst of times. Our applicants to become police officers are up more than 30 percent just in the last six months and our rec people who are leaving the organization have slowed. Now we haven't fixed it entirely. We got more work to do which is so as the city comes into 2024 and beyond as I leave this position I, and I hand the reins to the next chief it's going to be critical that they stay focused on reminding the public that cops count, police matter, the result of what they've seen is not just us alone but we're a critical ingredient to that success. Mm -hmm. So you talked about slowing the bleeding mm -hmm. and community policing uh, and we have seen major improvements. What else are you proud of? Proud of the work that we've done to uh, build technology. To When I came into and took the, the, uh, the privilege of being the chief, uh, the desktops, computers, for example, in our, in our stations were more than eight years old. Uh, we saw in the communication packages in our cars that it was something like AOL, <laughs> you've got mail. Uh, so the modems, the, all the technology that officers rely on so heavily was outdated. It was, it was legacy systems that were 30, 40 years old uh, and, and out of date. Through a concerted effort by both the city as well as by a historic level of, of foundational support, LA Foundation, LA Police Foundation raising millions of dollars because of the philanthropic community and the communities of residents of Los Angeles saying, what can we do to help? We took on an ambitious goal of rebuilding and, and modernizing our technology. As I leave here today, I look back to uh, accomplishments in technology where officers today have, uh, the, they all carry uh, phones, they all have modern smart computers, mm -hmm. they all have access to information that they've only dreamed to have uh, years ago, and we're on a pathway to, to make further improvements. So I'm proud of the technology. I'm also proud on the people side. This is a people business, is that the diversity, we have uh, deepened our, our ranks with women taking on command and senior positions within the organization. We've deepened our ranks with uh, equity and inclusion of, of people from all walks of life being a member of this organization and a valued member. But we still have work there to do because far too many of our officers still believe the disciplinary system is unfair, uh, the disciplinary system is overly harsh, and our promotional system does not always recognize uh, those that are most qualified. So we've got more work to do, but I believe as I look back and where we were five years ago or six years ago, just as my predecessor made progress, made incremental improvements, Charlie Beck uh, led this organization for some eight and a half years, and he, he left it better than he found it. I believe that our trust in our, organ in our community uh, of the police has improved in my time, that our interactions with them in demonstrating our commitment to community policing principles has deepened and emboldened and the wellness and well-being of our people, we've done everything we can in the most troubling and trying and dangerous time in our history to protect them and to serve them. And then lastly, the stage is set with strategic plans and initiatives that are well on their way to address the full component of what it takes to keep Los Angeles safe. And with that, it is now time to say thank you. It's been a privilege of a lifetime. So as we come to a close, what's your personal farewell to Angelinos? Well, first I say I'm not gone tomorrow. I, I'm still going to be around here for a little while longer. Uh, so, but as I will, I, my plan is to eventually move and, and uh, re relocate and be near my daughter. I just look back to the city of four million and say uh, how proud it should be in itself to recognize how much it has going for it uh, and to know that I, I'm proud to have been a part of it, be part of that L.A. story. And uh, I'm thankful to them for that opportunity. All right. Well, Chief Michael Moore, thank you so much for being here. We wish you well in the future as you embark on your retirement. Thank you. All righty. And that is going to do it for this edition of LA Currents. I'm Anita Bennett. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.